from wherever you are gathered to worship God at this hour, I extend to you a very, very sincere welcome to this hour of worship. In whatever situation of life you may be in, there is someone who knows about you, someone who cares about you, and he longs to give you the assurance that he will be with you. He will always be with you. He will never leave you, nor forsake you. And so it is my prayer today that as you listen to God's word and to the messages in song, may God touch your heart. May he reach you and bless you richly. His heart was broken Mine was mended He became seen Now I am clean The cross he carried Bore my burden The nails that held him Set me free this life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die? God's son would die to save. Cars of suffering brought me healing. He spilled his blood to fill my soul. His crown of thorns made me royalty. His sorrows gave me joy. Life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die? God's son would die.
2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 reads, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. At this time, we will allow for you to receive God's tithes and offering in your respective homes or small groups. However, if you wish to contribute electronically, the address can be seen on your screen. kindly ask you to close your eyes as we talk to our God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the countless blessings that you pour upon your children every day. We thank you for life. We thank you for everything that you give us. And as we have returned to you, our love gifts offering and the tithes. It is our desire that you will accept these gifts and you will use it to feather your work. And at this point in time, I would like to uphold your messenger as he speaks your word to your people. You will bless him, you will use him, and you will put words in his mouth to share with us today. May you bless all those who will be listening in. You will touch the hearts and you will help us to respond to your Holy Spirit as you speak to us today. In Jesus' worthy name we pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. We have been worshiping in our small groups now for and families for seven Sabbaths now. This is the seventh Sabbath, and I trust that you have been enjoying your worships despite being in the lockdown mode. I've so far been encouraged by the reports that I've been getting, despite the fact that not every one of you is uh, giving your reports. And um, as a matter of announcement, we will continue to worship in our families and small groups until the 20th of May, 23rd of May, which is Lesson 8. Then we will reopen for worship at the church. You see, the state of emergency and the lockdown has forced us to go back to our roots. That is the New Testament church. In how we do church, Three of the characteristics of the New Testament church that we are doing now as a result of the state of emergency and the lockdown are, number one, we have now been worshiping in our small groups. The New Testament church was a church where people were worshiping in houses. There were no church, church buildings. And so we are now being forced to worship in small groups and our homes. Secondly, sharing of food. The New Testament church, they shared everything that they had, including food. That was why they selected the seven deacons. Church family, I'd like to let you know the Corobos SDA church is also 
sharing food. We have food stuff at the church. If you are a member of the Corpusia SDA Church, and unemployed, and in need of food stuff, we can supply you. Come and see the caretakers at the church. And the third thing that the New Testament did was evangelism. The New Testament church made a great impact during their time. Despite the fact that they were in a difficult situation, they were able to turn their world upside down. When they received the Holy Spirit, it made a difference in their witnessing. The state of emergency and the lockdown should not stop us from the essence of the existence as a church, of our existence as a church. That is what we are here for. That is our core business, to evangelize. We are, were promised the Holy Spirit. And in fact, today the Holy Spirit is at our disposal. You know, Corpus SDA Church, we have purchased literature. We have purchased literature to distribute to our neighborhood. And we will be doing that next Sabbath, 2 o'clock. We'll come to the church and we will distribute literature that we have purchased in our community here. So if you are interested in assisting, distributing literature next Sabbath, make yourselves available at church at 2 o'clock. But this morning, our message will focus on the second aspect of the New Testament church, which is food sharing. Now, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm not going to talk about the sharing of food, but in general, I'll be talking about our response to people in need. Our responses to people in need. And my message for this morning is entitled, Three Responses to People in Need. First John chapter 3, verse 18, in the Good News translation reads, My children, our love should not be just words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. You see, the third chapter of First John focuses mostly on the concept of love. Because of his love, God not only calls us his children, he actually makes us his children. John also explains in the third chapter of 1 John how sin, including hate, is never the result of a proper relationship with God. And he says Christians, in contrast to the world, are supposed to do more than simply feel love. We are to act it out as well. And he did the application. When you read 1 John chapter 3, he talks about love, and when he comes to verse 17, he made an application in verse 17. And it reads, But if someone who is supposed to be a Christian has money enough to live well and sees a brother in need, and won't help him, how can God's love be within him? And following his application in verse 17, John summarizes the need for Christians to act on love. Not just think about it, but act out love. And so in verse 18, he says, My children, our love should not be just words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. Now, it is important to communicate love through our words, but we must also do through 
our action. It's not enough to just say you love someone. It must be expressed in action. It must be expressed in action. And in fact, while Jesus was on this earth, he gave a similar warning, similar warning to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15, verse 4 to 9. Let me read. For instance, God's law is honor your father and mother. Anyone who reviles his parents must die. But you say, even if your parents are in need, you may give their support money to the church instead. And so by your man-made rule, you nullify the direct command of God to honor and care for your parents. You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you? These people say they honor me, but their hearts are far away. Their worship is worthless, for they teach their man-made laws instead of those from God. Just as truly saying faith will produce good works, when you read James chapter 2, it says faith without works is dead. It is also true by saying that loving another person will produce loving actions. So when you love people, it must show in your action. It must show in your action. Jesus, while he was on this earth, not only spoke of love. No. He provided powerful actions to match his teachings. John 13 offers a clear example in which Jesus was the feet of his disciples to teach them to serve one another in humility. You remember that last supper that they had? Everything was in place and the disciples were looking around for someone to do the humble work of washing their feet. Jesus stood up and washed his disciples' feet. He put into action what he taught. Humility. His death on the cross offered the most powerful evidence of love in action. He came down, left his glory in heaven, came down to this earth because of his love for you and I, he died on that cruel cross of Calvary. That's why John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Probably the most famous story in the Bible about unexpected kindness is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus told this story to show us what it looks like to love people who are hurting. And it's easy. You know, many a times you come across people who are, you know, in need. Sometimes it is easy to feel guilty. And especially when we read this story. At one time or another, we all have, you know, passed by someone in need. And especially in these unprecedented times that we are in, there is a lot of people who are in need. People in our communities, people in our maybe small groups and families, in our villages, wherever you are, maybe in our offices. And this experience of seeing someone in need can be overwhelming that they can be paralyzing. And often when we come across someone in need, the question we often ask is, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And this morning, we will discover three answers to that question based upon the parable of the Good Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 36. 
You see, one day an expert, expert in the law of Moses came to Jesus to test him by asking him questions. And so he came to Jesus and he asked him, what does a man need to do in order to live forever in heaven? You know, this smart guy came to Jesus and asked him. And so Jesus responded and said, what does the Lord of Moses say? And this expert in the law of Moses replied, he said, well, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. And you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus turned to him and said, well, do this and you will live. But as a smart guy, he got up and asked another question. And he said, just to justify him, himself, he said, which is my neighbor? And Jesus replied with the illustration of the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 36. Let me read the, the story in the scriptures. A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who both stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. By chance, a certain priest was going down that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he traveled, came where he was. When he saw him, he was moved with compassion, came to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the host and said to him, take care of him. Whatever you spend beyond that, I will repay you when I return. Now, which of these three do you think seemed to be a neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? So the question we often ask when we come across people who are in need is, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And so there are three answers to that question based on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Number one, some people keep their distance. When they come across people in need, they keep their distance. This was the example that the priest gave us in the story. It says in verse 31, Luke chapter 10, by chance, a certain priest was going down that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So a priest was walking by. When he saw this man, he didn't get close to him. He just passed by on the other side of the road. What he simply did was he, he simply avoided the problem altogether. He didn't even want to know what the problem was. And this is what I call the lifestyle of avoidance lifestyle of avoidance we tell ourselves don't get too close to people you might have to help them you may get your hands dirty that was the priest's problem he was too holy to be helpful he didn't want to be stained by the stuff of life when we live a lifestyle of avoidance we try to keep all our relationship superficial if we keep everyone at arm's length we pretend that we don't see them. We don't see their pain. We don't see their need. And if we don't get involved, we can avoid getting into, you know, at ourselves or getting in convenience. So that's what we call the lifestyle of avoidance. 
Sometimes when we see people in need, we try to avoid the problem at all costs because simply we don't want to help. The second response is some people are curious but uninvolved. They're curious but uninvolved. And this was the example the Levite gave us in the story. Verse 32 says, In the same way, a Levite also, when he came to the place, saw him passed by on the other side. So the Levite came. He was curious of what had happened, went and saw the man, and then went on the other side and passed by. The Levite, who was the second man to walk by, the injured man, demonstrated this response. Curious, but uninvolved. Curious, but uninvolved. The Bible says, he went over and looked at the man before passing him by. In a way, you see, this response is much worse than the first. The first response was, you just keep at arm's length. You don't want to know about the problem. But in this case, it's like you go there, you see the problem, you're curious, you saw it, and then you just pass by without helping. In the first attitude, we see the problem from a distance and pretend it isn't there. But in the second response, we acknowledge the need through our curiosity, but we don't do anything to help. And we Papua New Guineans are good in this. When we see a commotion or anything, we are so curious. We run to see what's happening there. And then when we go and see what's happening, we don't try to help. Even if two people are fighting, or someone is in need, or somebody hitting his wife, we go there and we see what's happening, and then we don't do anything. My friends, you know, this is much worse. Because you are there witnessing the problem, the issue, and not helping. When we do this, we are simply saying, sorry, I can't be bothered. I've got more important things to do. You see, that's the problem. When we see people and we don't do anything, it's worse. Because our text says that we must put our love into action. We must put our love into action. And then the third and the last response is some people get close enough to care. Of course, this is the good Samaritan. He went above and beyond to help the injured man at his own expense. The Bible tells us but a certain Samaritan, as he traveled, came where he was. When he saw him, he was moved with compassion, came to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the host and said to him, take care of him. Whatever you spend beyond that, I will repay you when I return. Now, which of these three do you think seem to be a neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? He said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. You see, 1 John 3, 18 says, our love should not be just words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. Mercy takes action where others take off. Mercy isn't afraid to get it, its ends dirty. And Jesus calls every one of his followers, that is you and I, to have the attitude of the good Samaritan. Jesus you know what? Jesus deliberately chose a Samaritan to be the hero in this story. Why? Because the Jews 
hated the Samaritans. Mercy isn't just about helping people you like or helping people who are just like you. Mercy is about helping people no matter who they are, what they look like, or where they come from. That's what mercy is all about. And you know what, church family, this is one of the most important duties of Christians to help the needy. Helping the needy. When Jesus comes back the second time to take his children home, one of the stewardship questions he will ask each one of us is recorded in Matthew 25, verse 31 to 40. Let me read. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and on the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory and the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people who one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger while and invite you in? Or needing clothes? and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. You see, one of the reasons God blesses us with money and other resources is to meet the needs of the poor and the needy. In the end, you and I are accountable to God in how we respond to the needs of others. Corobosia Church family, in these unprecedented times, we are given opportunities to assist our brothers and sisters who are in need. And I trust that many of you are doing this. If you haven't, don't let the opportunities pass by. And I pray that as we are in these times, whatever God is blessing you with, you will also bless others. And when we do that, when Jesus comes back the second time, he will say, well done, thou good and faithful steward, enter thou into the joy of the master. May God bless you. No got something on this background. In a palm, I must sing you good. You can try more cut and roll. That's all you know. Now, I'm a must no more. You know, not a pine in the sea. You go in a Loving you, come on, Jesus, na kiss Friend, come on, Jesus, let me sing out yet, long you. Come on, Jesus.
Jesus no can for it Can we love in you Suppose you know God Plant is something Big plan in a kind of sin Suppose you know Him life, stop all time, all time. Come on, Jesus, now kiss him all alone. Friend, come on, Jesus, can we sing out yet? Long you. Mama's true, come long, Jesus, no can for it, and me love in you. Come long, Jesus, no kiss him life, stop all time, all time. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we would like to thank you once again for your word to us this morning. Lord, as we are in these unprecedented times, help us to see those who are in need and help us to express our love to them by assisting them in whatever ways we can. Thank you once again for talking to each and every one of us. Bless each and every one of us. Bless our families, our small groups, and continue to help us to um, be one and continue to help us to evangelize. May your will be done in our lives and our families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a Korobusia Seventh-day Adventist Church media production.